before I introduce everyone, I just want to say who's on the screen. I want to say why why am I doing this? Because we've done 24 apartment complexes that we've offered to the Seagull Capital Investor community. And so this is completely different, right? Completely different. And so I sent out a message to you guys saying why we've been pivoting. And I want to bring some clarity to that pivot. So over the last 12 months, my husband and I, on a personal level, we were exploring investment opportunities as part of our tax strategy that could help reduce his income tax um, for his W-2 job. He works at Google. And so we connected with Patrick and, um, and you know, he shared with us this investment with this team. Well, it's not the same because it was last year's funds. We invested in two of them, but we were using it personally. And then near the end of last year, we were like, wow, multifamily is getting skinnier and skinnier. And so I, I wanna bring clarity to that comment because it's not a bad time to own real estate. That is not what I mean at all by that comment. It means it's this skinnier time to acquire new real estate. So we still have a bunch of apartment complexes. They're still going strong. We're still holding on to them. It's not like we're doing a fire sale and dumping them. That's not what I mean by it's a, it's a time to pivot. What I mean is it's a tight time to acquire. So the new stuff that we're looking to buy, sellers have not come down in their price to compensate for the fact that debt is more expensive and the loan to value that we're getting from lenders is much lower. So instead of 75% loan to value, we're getting quoted 60, even 50% loan to value, which makes it such a skinny deal that it's really, we don't want to offer you a 5% return on your money. Nobody wants that. And so that is just for my statement about it's time to pivot is for new acquisitions. Um, and so I, I want to really make that clear. And I want to say, we're going to pivot back to that when the time is right. And so as really sophisticated money managers, which is what we need to be for ourselves, we need to know when it's a good time for different types of investment. And so that's what my husband and I have personally been doing over the last year when we got uh, introduced to King Operating. And so we're so excited to share this with you guys. Um, and I wanna address um, you know, the main objections. I just wanna, you know, let's talk about the elephant in the room because I got a lot of replies to emails um, and the questions were, hey, why this? This is not good for the environment. So we're going to address that today um, uh, with, this, with this team. We all have comments on that. And so we're going to let you know why we feel comfortable um, from a green, green perspective. Um, and then also, you know, a big objection was, hey, what is the, what is the collateral? What is the risk? So you're used to, hey, there's a building as collateral. So what is the collateral on this investment? We're going to address that too. So if those were your two primary questions, we're going to totally cover that today. And feel free, I'm going to kind of MC this and pass the baton between the folks you see on the screen. So feel free to be really active in the chat because if you have you know, common questions, I'll interrupt Eric and Patrick and say, hey, we need to address this question right now. And we'll definitely talk about the tax write-off. Um, we have a, a slide for that and we'll explain that, Jeff. So. With that, um, let's jump in. I'll just say, you guys all know me. I'm the founder and owner of Sugo Capital. We have about 615 million assets under management, um, all multifamily acquired with investors like you who are in our community. Um, we have a few funds. And so this is a pivot. This is something totally new, but something I'm really excited. So thank you all for being here. And I'll pass it on to, let's go with Patrick. Um, Patrick is on the advisory board with me, so I want to point out that the, the um, investments you've done with Sugo Capital, I've been the GP, you know, so I've been, um, had an active role in all the investments. Now with this investment, I'm in, on the advisory board, which means I can give advice, but I am not the operator, which is a good thing for you guys. You don't want me operating this. <laughs> So it's actually a very good thing. So um, Patrick was the one who uh, was my first contact who made the introduction. So Patrick, can you tell us a bit about yourself, your story, invest on Main Street, and why you chose to be involved with this company? Sure. Is is the screen shared? Am I somewhere? Or no, this... not yet. Okay. I haven't That's fine. pulled up the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Patrick Grimes. I'm the founder and CEO of Invest on Main Street. Had the delight of meeting Sarah uh, maybe a year ago or something like that. Yeah. Um, powerful force. So great that we built a relationship. 
Um, I came from a machine design automation and robotics. So like many of you, I was, you know, hardworking professional, making substantial income and looking for where the best places are to invest. Uh, lost a lot in 2008, uh, nine and 10. Uh, in real estate, came fighting out of that, and then scaled from single into multifamily. So Sarah and I are multifamily buddies, but I also diversify into alternative investments. And what we learned in 2008 is the ebbs and flows of real estate can sometimes uh, happen at the same time the stock market is down, like today. And so it's important to be in assets that don't ebbs and flow at the same time as real estate. And some diversified energies and energy portfolios is one of those ways. And so I started talking to her about it and I'm really glad that she came on board with us. And now we're at a, about a 500 million portfolio multifamily and 200 million in oil and gas. And Sarah's gonna, gonna join us and <laughs> come, come along for the ride. Awesome, thank you, Patrick. All right, Eric, tell us about um, your history, your background and what you're doing here. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so I'm I'm the uh, the chief growth officer at King, and my background is not too dissimilar from probably most of yours. Uh, I come from technology as well. So, uh, and I'm actually in Dallas, Texas now, and I come from I'm Chicago by nature, but uh, but I lived in Los Angeles for uh, 14 years, uh, between 15 between San Diego and Los Angeles. So significant time in the tech sector. Uh, my last venture, I've been a CEO or a founder for about 18 years. This is my first. Uh, employment opportunity here in about 18 years. And I, I love where I work. I, I definitely love what I do. Um, but I got all the phone calls that you're getting right now, Sarah, when I said, hey, I'm a growth officer at an oil and gas company because my last venture was quantum biology. So we were actually applying quantum mechanics to biological entities. And they're like, oil and gas. Um, and I guess I'll go through the explanation as to my logic a little bit later as to how I got here and derived that this is the best place for me to be able to serve my family, the country, and and my own personal, um, you know, passion. So very, very similar background to all of you. I've invested in everything. I started out as a money manager with Raymond James and Morgan Stanley, traded on the floors. Um, so I've always been uh, always been a, a fundraiser. I've raised about two hundred million for startups and things like that. And now we're now we're about I'm about ready to break hundred million in oil and gas. So it's just finding the right opportunities, much like you guys do, finding the right opportunities for people, sharing them with them transparently. And, and being able to answer questions and help people make the right decision, whether it's to invest with us or not, but the right decision is what we, we always achieve. Definitely appreciate that. And appreciate you being here. And yeah, I'm gonna ask you in a moment to share more of your story because it was one of the big draws for me about why you joined this team. Um, and then George is, I'll let you guys know, if you guys have questions about this investment, you know, after this webinar, please, please first of all, ask all your questions in this webinar. But if later you're watching the replay, or if something comes up and you ask a question, you will direct your questions to me. If it's something I can't answer because it's really, um, you know, technical or you know, really depends on something that I don't have enough knowledge to answer your question, George is your man. So that's why George is here. Um, I'll put you in touch with George if there's a question I can't answer. So I wanted you to see George. So if you talk to him, you know the the face with the name. Um, so George, why don't you just say? you know, who you are and um, and why you're part of King. Well, I've been in the oil and gas business for probably 38 years, uh, off and on, uh, managed a lot of different companies, uh, run several other companies and owned a lot of companies, too many to mention here. So always ended up back in the oil and gas business. Uh, it's uh, been something that uh, has been a career for me since probably 1973, when I got really interested in uh, what was happening in energy. Uh, to, so to just make it short, uh, I have a lot of knowledge in the field, love the company. That's why I'm here. I'm an investor and uh, I'll be glad to talk to anybody about it. Awesome, thank you, George. <laughs> All right, so how is it gonna go today? What are we gonna do? So investors, I'm just gonna pop you off, George. Thank you for that. And we'll have Eric, Patrick, and Sarah on the screen, and we're going to run, run through um, the presentation deck with you guys. But first, what we're going to do, because I always teach investors, when you're doing due diligence on an investment, what's the order? So, you know, the returns look nice, but you don't start there. You want to start with the team, doing solid due diligence on the team, and then you want to take a look at the market. And then you want to take a look at the actual investment. That's the order in multifamily in real estate, right? 
Um, and so the same thing applies here. So we're going to start with the team. So I am really, I heard the story of, you know, Patrick's due diligence and Eric's due diligence before he joined King. So King is the operator of, of this fund. You know, they're the ones actually going out and executing to make us all our great returns. And so, you know, it's not me, which is a good thing. And so we're going to just briefly hit on the, the due diligence we did on the team. And then we're going to go through why energy why is energy a good thing? So we pivoted away from multifamily, but why did we pivot to energy? We're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about why specifically King. So not just due diligence on the team, on a personality wise, but also their track record. We'll go through that and then we'll jump into the investments. So we are going to address most of the questions that I've seen in the chat so far. We are definitely going to have a slide to talk about how the tax benefit works. Everything else I've seen as a question in the chat, stick through to the end. We have a slide addressing all the questions I've seen so far. All right, so let's start with Patrick. You are like due diligence king. So tell us about your due diligence before teaming up with King. I left my crown in the other room, sorry about that. But yeah, so that's that's code for super geek and engineering nerd, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so I came from a, a little bit of an analyst background doing custom machine design. Uh, and I got a master's in engineering and an MBA. Uh, and so I did treat a lot of my investments with a, a hard lens for the numbers. And uh, that did apply towards when we started looking at dozens of different types of alternative investments like Sarah. And, and we started, we decided to start offering these out to our investors to provide a little more balanced diversification play. Uh, there was lots of deals that came up, many of them, many of them technologies uh, as in many of lots of different industries. Uh, and then the ones that really stuck to the surface of the alternative assets, this was actually the strongest. Um, and the company itself, there's lots of different ways that you need to look at these, uh, starting with who, then what, right? And with Jay Young, we'll talk about as the founder, he's been in this industry in this company for over 26 years. Uh, he's a fourth generation oil guy. He's on the news constantly. He's got a book out. He's a name. He's made a name for himself and he's got a reputation to uphold. And in the world of oil and gas, that's not always the case. People are oftentimes taking big risks and maybe it works one or two deals later, but then they disappear. And so you want to find somebody that's not only um, done good by investors over the long haul, uh, has, a, has a reason to keep that going, but has the right mindset. Uh, so he, when things have been tough, he came out of pocket. And we'll talk about that to make things right. And then he restructured the model, unlike every other type of oil and gas deal out there, which gives you a one or two or three well assignment, and you don't actually get to enjoy the, the secured asset of the lease and appreciation. He, he actually took a lot of the upside that was part of the operator, and he gave it back to the investors and said, let's partner not only on if we get cash flow from the well, but let's partner on the upside that I would get, which is the appreciation of the, the lease. And we'll talk about that a little bit more on the uh, acquire and divest strategy. And then as a company, they're very open book. You can see right here in the slide deck, we're gonna go through the past funds from when they started this new diversified model, which works to decrease the risk. They, they present the actual distributions. Uh, the investor reports that we've gotten have been 150 pages of data that my partner, Josh, went to the Texas Railroad Commission and worked to compare which handles the oil and gas, uh, which, which is what oil and gas reports to in Texas. Compare, are they doing what they say and saying what they do? Does their investor report actually show what is being, what they're actually producing? And we found alignment. Uh, further down that road, uh, we looked at the uh, background of the company and then we've looked at third-party reports, third-party audit reports, where just summary reports of this specific fund's audit was 42 pages just of a summary on the results by some of the better law firms available. In fact, one of the top four law firms for oil and gas opportunity, alternative asset due diligence, third-party due diligence, has been hired and done a review that only lifted the valuation of this fund. And it was all-encompassing from the... PPM to the offering memorandum, to the financial reporting, to the background checks of the executives, uh, to looking at the purchase and sell agreements of the lease, evaluating the potential of the fields and the business plan. 
And as a result of all that, for the first time in my whole career, we saw them actually raise the valuation of the fund from the two, 950 million it was to the today you're going to see as 1 billion, 50 million out of this world. So there's just a lot, and they're good guys. There's a lot of trust on the other side. They've been very open book. Uh, they have an, uh, a model of integrity and transparency. And when we've asked questions, they've opened the kimono, kimono and seen everything. And that's really what you need in a sponsor. And so from the analytics side, from the who side, we really found a good long-term partner. And I love that story, Patrick, about what, what happens when things go wrong. Um, and I've told, you know, those of you who are in the audience who've been with us for a while now, you've probably heard this story, but there's some new folks as well. So I want to share this story about how I choose partners. So in multifamily, the same thing happens. It's not 100% of the time we exceed returns. There are times when stuff doesn't go according to plan that, you know, things are completely out of our control. So I always look for partners who, hey, do we throw the operating agreement out the window and give 100% of returns for investors when something goes wrong? And so the partners that I they have on the multifamily, that is the way they view things. If you know, something doesn't go according to plan, we don't need any profits. We give 100% to investors in order to make sure we hit the targets for them. We had to do that twice on the, on a, you know, two out of 224, two out of 24 apartment buildings. So it doesn't happen often, but when it happens, you definitely want a partner who has that same mindset of investor first. So I appreciate that story, Patrick. All right, Eric, tell us your story um, because yours is a little different, but you had to do due diligence before being on the team, um, not just investing, but I love what you did. So please share that with everyone. Yeah. So our, and Patrick does a really good job at explaining that. I mean, we, we go through our company values at least once a month, you get drilled on them. You need to know what they are. Um, we are, we are very, I, I won't hide this at all. We're, we're, we're all very much Christian in this company and we kind of believe in, in the, in the biblical values of life and transparency, truth, openness, acceptance, um, being there to be accountable for the things you've done wrong, which is what drew me in. So my story from this is I was running a small public company in California. When COVID hit, we lost I don't know, 94% of our potential retail uh, sector. So we lost about 90% um, uh, of our revenue right off the bat. And a lot of things happened. I just saw kind of saw an openness in Texas to, to get my kids here back in school. And it's kind of the same California to Texas story you hear quite often, taxes, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, I spent a good uh, well over a year serving and kind of building my own ministry, uh, doing some consulting work. Um, I, I, I get like, Sarah, I probably get like 50 or 60, um, you know, slide decks in my email every month from entrepreneurs all over the place looking to raise capital because I've been in it for so long. And uh, after a while, you know, uh, of serving and, and volunteering, I was looking for a job and I hadn't done that in a while. So uh, I got called by a lot of energy companies, uh, being that I came from the quantum space. So even though we we're in biologics, uh, I still understand this, the, the energy sector at this level pretty well. And when I met with Peter, our conversation was just amazing. And, and I came in for an interview. And during the interview, they, they told me what the investment was. And mind you, I've been a money manager for years. I was managing capital in my 20s all the way through my 30s. And as I got through the interview, I started hearing about the investment. And I said, well, this sounds, this, this sounds ridiculous to me um, that I get a tax benefit, monthly income, and a multiple. Because I'd seen oil and gas deals as a broker for years. And I'd never seen any multiple added to it. So I never actually recommended any to clients. And from the broker dealer space, it was, it was a difficult challenge to bring an alternative investment onto a platform. It's very important to note anything outside stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and insurance is very difficult to get into a broker dealer network. And every now and then we'd see one. So when I came in, I interviewed, I got the job in a couple interviews and I interviewed the company for about three weeks. I sat down with Rex, uh, our former CFO, we're transitioning him into retirement uh, right now, but he is literally a... Uh, a whisperer of knowledge, as, as Patrick calls it. This guy knows everything about the industry, but I grilled him for two weeks. How, are, how is the fund structured? How are we doing this? How are returns conveyed to people? What is our percentage split? Is this authorized? Is this, is this ethical? Is this legal? Is this moral? Uh, went through this entire process with them and had a chance to meet the entire team. And I was here as an SVP for about a month uh, before I, I took over Peter's job, who's now the president. And it's just been incredible to see the, the ability of suggestibility in the company. So you generally find people like Jay who've been on oil rigs since he was nine years old that are 
just set in their ways, won't accept a new way of doing things, but we constantly have weekly meetings discussing new ideas. That's why we formed an advisory board uh, to bring folks like you on to help us learn how to grow our business in a more integral way uh, and to be able to see from the outside what it is that we're doing so we can constantly get better at communication and transparency. Um, but the model in this, in this building is, is pretty tremendous. Uh, I've never worked at a place like this, and I've always been able to create my own culture. And now I don't have to. The culture was kind of built in place. Uh, we just rotate on, you know, we make, we're human beings. We make mistakes. Uh, we're also human beings. We, we're we going to fumble the ball. And we're going to score some touchdowns. And somewhere in the middle of that is where humanity rests. So the ability for us to be able to be honest about where we are, what we're doing all along the way um, is, is tremendous. So I work with our SVP and the growth team now. And, you know, part of our training is when things go well, that's the worst time to call people. Call people when things go bad. They want to know ahead of time. We're all adults. We're all investors. I'm an investor in the fund. George is. Almost all of us are. Um, we we have a fundamental theory in this place. We love this country. We want to, want to make it energy independent. And we absolutely hate taxes. So we love what we do for a living. We get to keep people from paying taxes and support the uh, energy sector in this country. I can go on for hours about the story and where we're at, but I, I don't think I don't think that's uh, where we want to begin. So I just love it. Kind of, it's almost like an oxymoron. I love the country, but I don't want to pay taxes. <laughs> Well, but I understand what you mean. I understand what yeah, you mean. There's there's a deeper story there. Of it's investing yeah. along the side of the country where they want you to, and they reward you by not paying taxes. That's right. Yeah, That's exactly. Right. All right. Um, so I see a bunch of questions. Folks are saying, hey, what's the what's the presentation? What's the et cetera? So I didn't have it up yet. I'm gonna bring it up now. And if you guys want to follow along in the data room. I'm going to put the link in the chat and then we're going to bring it up and we're going to start diving into the deck. All right, there's the data room in the chat. Okay, so I'll bring up the PowerPoint, share my screen, and we'll get rocking. Okay, PowerPoint, there we go. Share it out. Go back to the beginning. Cool. So you guys, the cool thing about this, which I, I've mentioned several times in my email marketing, is that there are three ways investors get paid, and we're going to go through that, um, but it's, it's super fun, and that's pretty unique um, in this space to have an, an investment in oil and gas that pays out three ways. So there's the tax advantage, which you guys are very excited about, and we'll go through how that works. Um, there's the payouts that, you know, I get money in my bank account every month. Uh, and then there's appreciation on the exit. So it's similar to multifamily because in multifamily, you get the tax advantage. In multifamily, you get the cash flow. And in multifamily, you get the equity upside on the exit. And you're kind of used to in multifamily, a three to five year hold. This is similar. So there are so many parallels. And as we go through the investment, um, Eric will kind of explain a piece of the investment. And then Patrick's going to show the parallels to multifamily. And that's one of the reasons we're presenting this to you, even though we have a whole bunch of other things that are great investments we've been investing in. We felt that this was so in line with what you guys want, what you're used to, um, and, and that you would really, you know, latch onto as a good investment for you. So just before we got on, um, they asked me to update this slide. It is now 1.05 billion is the new um, uh, assessment. So do you want to hit on that, Eric? What, what, that mean? what does that mean? It's a 1.05 billion energy portfolio. Yeah, so the, so the thing that makes us very similar, I, I always, we deal with a lot of multifamily investors. And the thing I always tell people is you're trading toilets and tenants for oil and gas. Um, it's still the same type of play. We're getting uh, swaths of land, developing them and then ultimately divesting. So when you look at the combined total of hydrocarbons underneath the, the surface of the earth that we're extracting and selling in the open market and the ability for the surface to yield these hydrocarbons to the market, you're looking at a, a combined overall you know, uh, open market value of the properties. So right now between the two, two properties and we'll add a second or excuse me, a third or a fourth over time, but the total value between the hydrocarbons and the actual land for future drilling for, for someone else is a little over a billion dollars. But the interesting story is, thank you, thank you. A hype behind the green energy movement replacing oil and gas. It's just simply not a logical deduction at this point. So when you look at what Buffett's doing and Aramco, they're all coming out and saying the same thing. There's been so much money invested in green energy over the last 10 years. And this may make someone upset with not tremendous results that the money should be flowing directly back into energies that are that are solid that work 24 hours a day that you don't need assistance from 
to actually grow. So we're seeing companies like Warren, or guys like Warren Buffett put money into publicly traded stocks. Uh, you know, Kiyosaki said in that last video, the money is in the oil field. That's where the money is made, is in the actual um, pulling, the oil, pulling hydrocarbons out of the ground and selling them into the market. This is where the money is made. But we're seeing this, this trend back into investing in oil and gas simply because the market dictates. Uh, with China reopening after COVID right now, you're looking at about 300 million people going back to full, full life, driving to work, working in factories, running their cars, running their homes. This big spike in demand, which many analysts equate to about 4 million barrels a day, new demand on the system, uh, correlates directly with a reduction of about 8.5 million barrels a day between the U.S., Russia, and OPEC. This, this is a really important time in history for money to be flowing in the right direction, because without oil and gas, there will not be green energy. You need oil and gas to build the new technologies of the future and to excavate all of the materials from underneath the surface of the earth. Very important time in history. You're gonna see a lot more people shifting capital back into oil and gas for tax advantages and for the profitability you'll see in the next couple of years. Love it, thank you for that. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip that one. Oh. That one automatically played. Um, this one I think is in interesting. Um, and you can see the date on these, these different articles and publications. It's from last year. And we talked about you know, changing them to some more uh, recent news around this space. But we elected to keep it on to show you the trend. So the trend is not like all of a sudden it's a great time to invest in this. It has been, the trend is that it has been a strong time to invest in oil and gas. Um, and Patrick, there was an OPEC update last week that you mentioned. Um, do you want to let us know what that was and how that affects this? Right. So in addition to what Eric was saying about Russia misbehaving in Europe, pulling out of Russian natural gas, and which made for a while last year, the United States, the biggest exporter of natural gas for the first time ever. Um, and OPEC, which unfortunately has a lot of control over the puppeteer of our country and from the energy from the essential need, uh, they're playing games and they said they're going to dial back 2 million barrels a day. And then they just, this, and this was, this was fourth quarter last year. And they just eight days ago, uh, reassured that they were going to continue to stick to that path, um, between that Russia, uh, also saying they're going to dial back. 500 million barrels a day, sorry, 500,000 barrels. And um, uh, we find ourselves in a very tough time. And as what Sarah was saying, my, my family actually collects from an oil trust. And because of how favorable things are right now, that's doing much better than it has in a long time. Uh, the government's trying to ease that by using strategic reserves. But now the strategic reserves in the United States of America are 40 years, that the lowest had been in 40 years. So we're, we're about running out to that point where we're going to see uh, at least sustained or growth in, in the natural gas and oil pricing. Thank you for that. All right, so now why King Operating? So we've already talked about the team um, on a kind of qualitative level, why we like the team and trust them, and there have been audits and stuff like that. But qualitatively, what have they actually done for investors? So they've been around for 30 years. There's been ups, there's been downs, just like any type of investing. But let's dig into the track record. So Eric, I'd love if you kind of told about the experience and then the next slide will be the track record. Yeah, so I mean, combined here, we actually did a poll on this a few weeks ago to find out how much actual oil and gas experience we have here. So in the walls of this corporate uh, office, not, not in the fields, you know, not the roughnecks in the fields that are drilling, but just in our corporate office, we have about 140 years of oil and gas experience. So our CEO, Jay Young, uh, he's a fourth generation oil man. So, so from the time he was nine years old, he's been on oil rigs with his grandfather. Uh, we've got Rex Gifford here, who's um, I don't want to give away Rex's age. I don't want to do that to him. Uh, <laughs> Rex, is, Rex has been around for a while. Uh, he was our C CFO for 15 years. He's been a CFO in the oil and gas space for about 30 years. And for the previous 10 years before that, he was actually an oil and gas auditor with the IRS. So there really isn't much about the industry from a strategic or tax uh, standpoint that he doesn't know. Uh, but this 140 years together is all across the board. So we also have um, Chandler Knox, who's in the office next to me. He's our COO. Uh, younger guy, uh, MBA in, in petroleum engineering. He is the head of operations, runs all of our drilling projects. Uh, what he just pulled off, uh, Shell, 
some of these other large companies wouldn't even attempt to complete what he's done. His last couple of projects before us were small independent drilling operations like ours that ended up in the billions of dollars in, in total value, including working for some of the companies like the Hunt family. Uh, we also have our most recent addition to the team, I think is probably one of our strongest, uh, Nathan Myers, our in-house counsel. So very rarely will you find an independent drilling company that even has an in-house counsel. It's generally an outside sourced uh, law firm. Uh, but Nathan is one of the 300 board certified oil and gas attorneys uh, in Texas. And predominantly the certification means that you open up your own your own law firm and, and take in a bunch of clients, and which Nathan did, but he loves the change in the model. Again, adding the assets, adding the land value for the investor is a game changer in our industry. And Nathan has come aboard full time with us. Uh, we also have John Malden on, on our in-house team. Uh, John is a well-known uh, global economist. He's got books and CNBC appearances for about the last 40 years. Uh, John came on board with us. He's actually one of our guys that's going to be promoting this here on Saturday. Um, but he actually closed down his broker dealer to become our chief economist here. Um, we also have Paul Jerome, who it, Paul has the best job in the world. If you're an employee, you'll love this. Uh, Paul gets offers from every other company in the world, and all he has to do is show us his offer. We match his uh, salary and keep him at work here. We love Paul. He's very integral into us selecting properties, uh, figuring out where to drill, where the best yields come from. Geology is of the utmost importance here. We've also brought on Mike, uh, Michael Tanner uh, as an analyst here uh, from the School of Mines in Colorado. Brilliant young guy, great analytical mind. He does all of our, our projections and forecasts and analytics. Um, along with Garrett Stacy, who came in here, who's also a second generation petroleum engineer. So we are adding a lot of engineering, a lot of geology, a lot of drill muscle power, which we need because we have a lot of projects going at this moment in time. As far as we know right now, we're the most active independent driller in Oklahoma and Texas. So uh, having a small team to begin with and building out was, was just tremendous. Um, Jay is, by the way, our CEO is always our biggest investor in our funds, uh, as are the entire executive team. We invest in these funds as well. We, we do the exact same thing we ask you to do as an investor. Uh, but transparency between all the years that we have, all the knowledge we have, um, Patrick knows this. I've been building what's called, I call it the Rex file. So when Rex gets asked all these uh, difficult questions about oil and gas or taxation, we, we save them all into a repository and share them around the team. So we're really doing a lot of knowledge transfer and share, which doesn't just stay within the walls of the team. Uh, we're more than happy to educate. We've got 11 people in our SVP division. Uh, that are more than happy to educate clients at any given time. Uh, we're here to answer questions and build transparency. It really is at the forefront of what we do. But all this comes based on the model that Jay created. So uh, having seen oil and gas deals since I was in my early 20s, they're, they're pretty simple. You make an investment, you get a tax write-off, you hope the company can execute what they need to do to get the write-off accurate, uh, which doesn't always work out. We actually have a competitor who got kicked out of the broker-dealer system for promising 85% tax return and delivering 13%. So we have seen this, this fumble before, but after the tax incentive, essentially what you own is an assignment to the sales. So almost all these other deals are one to three wellbore deals. And essentially you own the oil and gas. Once it's pulled out of the ground, you share in the profits until the oil and gas company sells the land. And that's where the profits are made. So this is the first oil and gas deal that I've ever seen where the investors actually participate in the same exact manner as the sponsors and the partners. This is generally not the way it goes. So when we kicked off this model, we stopped doing a lot of the other business we'd done for 20 plus years. And uh, bringing, Jay bringing to the table guys like Peter, who are making some really big changes within the company, and, and some of the new executives we've brought on. I can't, can't be more excited about the future and what we're doing, but at the same time, you know, we're keeping pace of the market. We've called market trends accurately for the last six to six to nine months. And that has a lot to do with communication with the outside world, not just dealing with oil and gas. So the, the overall theme from a sponsor's perspective here is that you've got maybe more experience in our industry than any deal you'll find ever. Um, we're a large team with a lot of experience and those who don't have experience, we have definite gateways into education from those who, who've walked a mile in, in other people's shoes. So Great team, great assembly of team. Oops, I did not mean to bump out to that. So as a summary, you guys, of you know who's who and what are the roles. Um, so Sugo Capital and Invest on Main Street. So Sarah and Patrick, we're on the advisory board. King Operating is the sponsor who's actually running everything. So their track record is really what you want to pay attention to. Eric is on that team. Jay is on the team. All the people he was talking about are on that team. So thank you for that, Eric. And... Let me just 
something funky happened, guys. Stick with me. Um, my mouse is <laughs> my mouse is. I'm just gonna stop sharing and try this. Mouse, mouse is enjoying away. its President's Day holiday. <laughs> yeah, it went away. Right when we we're talking about track record. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's try this again. All right. We're going to do. Okay, perfect. Let's try sharing again. You guys, I see a ton of questions and know that I'm not ignoring you. I just know that we're going to get to it in the presentation, which is why I'm not addressing them. Because I know we're going to get to it. And I've seen a lot of okay. background questions pop up in there. So I just took Jay, our CEO, to an event that we needed circuit, Secret Service background checks done to go to. So we're good there. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> we went. It was fun. Cool. So a track record. Um, this is not the first time King Operating has had a fund. So this is their fourth fund. Um, so up here, the, the four boxes that you see are fund one, two, and three, and the results of those. So what is being offered to you today is the third fund. Um, and so it opened at the very end of 2022, right? Um, but it is open now and it's open until it's full. So the full fund is 200 million um, and it is first come first serve, but uh, I expect with the speed at which you filled the last fund that it will it'll get filled up um, within the next two, three months, something like that. But I want to point out, um, you know, the the first the first uh, fund that they did, it was the 3x multiple. And it looks like in two years. So, you know, that's pretty nice. The second fund was what they talked about, where there were some hard lessons learned, but the team jumped in, uh, made investors whole. Um, there were regulatory obstacles in the pandemic. And then the um, the third one is, is still alive and, and going. These are the this is what I invested in last year with King Operating, and so this will be the fourth one. And we have detailed slides in this deck later on. We're not going to go through, but if you want to see the detail of these three of these four, well, three from the past, um, they are in the slide deck, and it will be in the investor portal for you. So I know we are at, we have um, about 10 more minutes and <laughs> we're just getting to the actual investment. Um, but if you guys can stay on longer, you know, maybe another half an hour, we'll get through the full executive summary. Um, and then I will walk everyone through how to subscribe. I see a lot of questions about that. So I'll bring up the investor portal and show you how to navigate the links and, and activate everything. So investment summary, executive summary. So there are three ways that investors get paid the tax incentive, um, the cash flow, and the upside. And so Eric, why don't you tell us, there's the just gonna, what is the strategy and, and how is this gonna work? Sure, yeah, like you said, we're raising $200 million towards a $1.50 billion uh, exit or full, full value exit. Um, there's a three-pronged approach with us. So from an investor perspective, you get 100% write-off on the way in. You get monthly income from the sale of hydrocarbons in the market. That also has an extreme tax advantage until your capital is returned to you. And then, of course, a multiple. But the way that we structure our business is very similar to multifamily. So we're looking to acquire properties, develop them, and then divest ultimately. So for us, the acquire, develop, and divest model is always the incremental path to, in which to it we look. So I always explain this very simply. The difference between multifamily and oil and gas is very thin. We look for a piece of raw land that has great geology uh, that we've done a lot of diligence on. And once we found that, you can go back to that last slide. That's actually a good place. So okay. what we're looking Why for is- I show like the location because a lot of people are asking like, where's the location? So you guys can see this is roughly where, where it's all happening. Yes, okay. yeah, absolutely. So, so before we acquire land, it's important that, that everyone understands that it's a slide we generally have, which you, you're more than happy to contact us. We can walk you through the full deck. Uh, but we're always looking for oil and gas friendly regulatory environments, just like real estate location matters more than anything else. So we're looking for land that's state or, or, or personally owned. So right now, our property in Borden County, there's one landowner, one mineral right owner. This is an exceptionally rare piece of property that's very flush underneath the surface. So we have a ton of oil and gas to pull out of there. Um, but we will give you a full breakdown of the methodology of how we find land. We fast forward it for time's sake. Once we acquire leases, which we do with the fund money, uh, we begin to raise equity. And that's where we are right now. So we're in the middle of drilling our first well in Borden County, which the reserve reports and the, the mud logs that we're getting right now are, I won't be, I won't be too um, boisterous about this, but they're very good. Um, very, very good right now. So what that does is it helps us develop what we call PDP, Proven, Developed, and Producing Wells. PDP equals revenue. 
as we grow PDP and we grow revenue, what we're doing is increasing the value of the entire property of all the land. So in oil and gas, it's, it's a lot very similar to multifamily where you, you build a new apartment complex and the value of the land is predicated on occupancy rates, rental rates, things like that. With us, it's the reserves are there, the technology in oil and gas, we know where all the oil and gas in the world is. It's just a matter of will the land yield? So once we start proving this out through PDP and revenue, we then start to prepare other locations to drill. So we prepare the surface. Those are called PUDs or proven undeveloped wells. These have tremendous amounts of value when you're selling the property to either an investor or another oil and gas fund. So we do all these things simultaneously. We drill new wells, produce revenue and develop the land for a future uh, valuation. And that opens up the divestiture window. So every action that we have within the fund on this slide is designed to increase the value of the land to sell it to someone else. Um, and that's really, really kind of the core of what we do. Patrick, do you want to add to that? You've seen well, there was there was a whole lot of uh, techie jargon there, right? And when, and I I did, if I could just simplify, I think the next slide is the best slide. But if I could just simplify it, um, as real investor, real estate investors, which is I'm assuming most of the people here are, um, we buy real assets, right? We buy real property, and we were saying most other oil and gas guys, every other investment that I know of, they'll put you in and a piece of a cash flow of a real asset, but you won't own the real asset. Now, that's kind of like saying, if you have an apartment building, the operator is saying, well, you know what? I own the building and you get the cash flow from one unit or maybe two units or maybe three. That's like a, that's equivalent to a, a, a well bore assignment. But what we're doing is we're saying, you know what? Uh, we found this plot that is surrounded by producing wells or surrounded by analogous to buildings that have value in our cash flow, right? And so we're going to buy on a place that's proven reserves, uh, where underneath this, we know we actually have natural grass and oil because we have wells around it. And we've done this studies. That's like saying, hey, there's a spot between these two buildings. Let's buy that building. And instead of just putting you in one unit, uh, we're going to put you, we're going to actually put this plot of land, the lease for that plot of land that control, we're going to put all that in the fund. So now you're like the sponsor, just like you are in a multifamily deal. You get, you get the secured asset. Okay. But we're just not going to, and so with inside that plot, say it's an apartment community with lots of different buildings. Well, we're, we're buying these leases with, with already we're proven undeveloped sites with their, with their sites where we're like, well, we can put a building there. We can put a building there. We can put a building there, right? And, and they've are the geology and engineering, as you see down there, 18 drill ready locations, geology and engineering planning and completed. That's very similar to development projects in real estate where you got 18 buildings, right? And we're just going to, and so what we're going to do though, in addition to putting the lease itself with all these spots ready to go, we're going to value, we're going to put that in the fund. We're going to value add. We're going to buy this fund. We're going to, sorry, we're going to buy this lease, put it in the fund. We're going to raise the capital to build the building sequentially, right? That's analogous to drilling the wells on proven locations. And what's different is that now with each, when each building's completed, you're getting the cash flow and each pad might have multiple wells, right? You're getting the cash flow from those. And then when that happens, it appreciates the lease. Just like how when you get greater cash flow from the building, it appreciates the building. And because the lease is inside there, we have all the assets inside there. It allows for you to participate in that appreciation. But we're, we're not saying that even. We're saying, look, that's equivalent to just one location. And King operates in five locations. So they're analogous to a multifamily operator with holdings in many different states, right? We're saying, well, really to do this uh, uh, low risk, in each lease, we're going to need to do lots of wells, not just one, two, or three. We're going to need to do dozens of wells. And that, that's essentially saying, hey, if one unit in a multifamily building has a fire or has a flood, and that operator only put you on a cash flow position of that one unit, you could potentially lose it all. That's not how we invest in multifamily. We, do, we, we decrease our risk by doing things at scale. We have hundreds of units, right? So in order to map that real estate principle to an oil and gas deal, we can't be one of the operators who put you in one, two, or three wells. We need to do dozens of wells, right? And that way, if there's a dry hole or if there's a drill bit step halfway down, that just happened to us in the last, last fund. Do you know what happens? It washes out because we have economy of scale. 
we've decreased what is a typically very risky investment, which is oil drilling. And we've reduced that risk by doing improving locations and then doing it scale. But lessons learned from prior you know, funds is that sometimes politics can change. It can be harder to permit, right? So like us, we invest not in one physical geographic location. We invest in lots of physical geographic locations. So we're not just going to buy one proven place in one location. We're going to buy them in multiple locations. And currently, the two yellow spots are the two places that the Bighorn Basin, the Permian Basin, those are, those are the drill-friendly locations or drill-friendly basins analogous to landlord-friendly locations that we've purchased leases, proven, and we're looking at a third, right? So now we have geographic location diversification, but we get a bonus there. Why? Because we're drilling in different spots. We can target different geologies. We can target different products. So now we can do half natural gas and half oil within the same fund. That's like saying you're going to do a mixed use property or you're going to invest in a mobile home park. You're going to invest in a, in, a, in a multifamily building. You're going to invest in commercial. You're going to invest in, because we're investing in multiple locations with multiple different products. It helps to decrease the risk of one volatile product and one customer being constrained from another. So we get it through proven secured assets like we do in real estate. We get it through scale, right? We get it through geographic diversification that also gets us products. So we can work with multiple different commodities, right? And in all of those ways, this is very analogous to your current real estate portfolio in that it provides you with all of that, but in one fund to decrease the risk and get into something that's completely non-correlated. And that's the, that's the bridge that I wanted to map out for Sarah. Yeah, I appreciate that. And can you explain to the exit, like what is the exit? How do you sell, like in multifamily, you, you sell a building, that's pretty obvious. So how do you sell, you sell the site, um, let people know that detail uh, again in a little more detail. Well, so I'll give you mine and then Eric can give you his. So just I, I just like in real estate, when you have a cash flowing building and you increase the cash flow, you're going to have producing wells. Those are assets that are now weren't there before. You went to a high probable drill site. You drilled and now you're producing cash flow. Now that cash flow has value. It has value to the same people that we sell our multifamily buildings to, large endowments and hedge funds. Also, other large oil and gas operators local to these want to scoop them up and add them to their portfolio. The leases themselves have proven reserve valuation. And once you drill and you're like, okay, there actually is oil and gas, well, we've got it going. Now you can get a third party to say, this is your reserve report for what's under here. In addition to that, once you drill, you're like, well, you know what? Our 3D seismic, which is bat sonar a mile deep, says this same pancake layer to Sarah's, is now present all over here too. So here's your next high probable drilling site. And that's what Eric called was a proven undeveloped site. That HUD, each one of those that you identify, those can all be sold. So it's a combination of the cash flowing assets which you've developed, the reserves that are now proven underneath the lease, and the additional future drilling sites available for the next guy. And all that kind of adds up to that 1 billion, 50 million at the bottom line. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, what we're doing is, is two prong. We're building a security and an economy of scale at the same time. So from the securities perspective, we're creating an income generating security with a tax advantage. That's kind of one way to look at an oil and gas fund. So two years after all the capital is raised, we start targeting endowments and pensions and family offices that have income mandates. And if you look at the interest rate trends where we are right now, the illiquidity in the treasury market, a lot of problems in bonds, like the average corporate bond is triple B right now. So the average corporate bond is one step up from junk. We're, we're actually in the right place at the right time in the market to be able to offer. That's why we're so excited to raise money and start drilling wells, because the more income we produce, the faster we'll return capital back to investors. So our goal on divestiture is two prong. Two, two years after capital is raised, uh, we'll begin to shop the income or sell a portion of the security to an endowment or, or a pension fund that has an, a, a mandate for producing income monthly. Uh, we're a very attractive place there. The PUDs, like Patrick was talking about, the proven undeveloped areas that we know there's oil and gas there, the, the surface area, the pads prepared, we just have to drill. 
that's attractive to other, other working interest companies or major oil and gas companies. And right now they're projecting a zero to 5% return over the next five years. They are in a scout and acquire mode. They are looking for independent operators that will develop an oil field out of a piece of land that's analogous to other successful operations. And by the way, the, the Borden County, Texas, uh, in, in the Permian Basin right now, we're analogous to maybe the most successful well we've ever seen or heard of in the industry. So very, very good area right now. But uh, to kind of rewind on this slide, the two yellow dots, we already have assets acquired there. We're already in play. We're actually negotiating with the three gray areas to add us a third and possibly fourth uh, piece of property to this fund. So you'll see the fair market value rise, PDP rise over time, but it's all about drilling and producing revenue so that we can sell that to a pension or an endowment, return uh, capital back into the investor's hands. And then over the, the following two and a half years is to continue the development of the economy of scale and sell it off to one of the major companies that will be lacking in new hydrocarbon reserves. On that so, same point, I take a question from William. And so he's saying, so will the benefits in the cash flow continue after some of those are sold off or, it, okay. The answer absolutely, is yes. yes. Yeah, that, that, that's the beauty of, of, I'm trying to dodge the sun. It's coming in on here on me uh, as the sun's you're good, going. You're good. Uh, but yeah, that is one of the major benefits is, is we're, we're, our model is designed to include the assets for you as the investor so that within two years we return, we target, we can't guarantee it, of course, because we have still have to sell land uh, and sell income. But we, we target reaching out to the endowments and pensions right off the bat and allowing them to see our track record develop. So two years down mm -hmm. the road, they will have seen us grow from day one, and we will have built an attractive income model for them to purchase. But they're going to acquire 35 to 45 percent of the fund, not the operation, but the fund. So yes, you'll still be receiving monthly income from us even after the first divestiture. Okay, awesome. And then and the, the monthly... Oh, sorry, go ahead. But let me parallel that because there's a lot of big words there. So first divestiture, what does that mean? That just means a sale, right? And so if you go back to the, the real estate Example, a realistic example, you have, we bought this lease and we're, we're, we've got these locations to build on and we're going to build uh, some, or we're going to drill some wells in these proven locations. But once we've drilled enough to where we can sell off uh, some of those buildings to be able to return your invested capital, we're going to do that. Just like in multifamily, how we have monthly passive income, and then we try and do a refinance to return investors capital to try and de-risk your investment as soon as we can. Analogous is we're going to we're going to drill these wells, and as soon as we can sell off enough of it to be able to get the capital returned in two or three years down the line, we'll do that. Now it's not a refinance because it's a partial dive; those those assets are gone. And then when we continue through the rest, call it three to five years of the fund, we'll we'll, we'll use the rest of the capital drilling on the proven sites. We'll have all these pads that aren't drilled on. Those are ones that have been, those are ones that also have value that can be sold. The other thing he said was analogous to the best well in the Permian or the best region in the Permian. And so, or the Permian is the region and the best location. Analogous just means adjacent. So what he's saying is that there's a building right here that is potentially one of the best wells in the entire Permian basin. Our plot is right over next to it which means that those reserves are spilling over into our area. And that's absolutely the case. Literal, so, yeah, literal. It, literally the case. And so I'm just, and so what it means is these people have, have completely occupied this building. And as soon as we build this one, they're going to spill over into our units, right? And we're going to get that cash flow. And when we continue to drill, they're going to continue to spill over. So essentially it's the same principles. It's, it's just oil reserves as opposed to renters. And we're developing wells as 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 opposed to building buildings, but I, but the same exact principles. Yeah, love it. And then um, there's questions since we hit on some risks already about you know what are the risks of if oil prices tank go down, and is that why there's an estimate of fourteen to twenty one percent annual cash flow? Is that what causes that range? Um, yeah, so our target projections are 80, 80 a barrel for oil and six for natural gas. We're a little bit below the 80 right now, but every analyst out there ranging from Arnod to Kupperman are, are touting 120 to 200 a barrel by the end of the year. So there's a little bit of a patience game there. Natural gas is really low. It's about 250, which right now we're focusing more on oil than gas just for, for economic purposes. But if we look at 
uh, the projections over time and the risks involved. Pricing is the major risk, but we're profitable. Uh, once the well is built and constructed and in place and the pumps are going, you know, our costs to pull a barrel of oil out of the ground are nominal. Uh, so we're profitable even in the high 30s, low 40s for the price of oil. And if we see $39, $40 a barrel for oil, we have much bigger global economic problems than, than, than an oil field in Texas. Um, the, the math is not, I mean, supply is not meeting demand as we speak. Uh, the, the lag time in pricing in, in hydrocarbons right now is really unpredictable. Uh, but in the end, the, the results always come back. So yeah, pricing is definitely a, a major, probably the primary risk factor in, in hydrocarbons or oil and gas business. Let me build that analogy there because we, in, in multifamily, it may be more so because we have significant amounts of debt. We call it low leverage, right? But we're at 60, 70% leveraged. So we have these big debt payments coming through. Right. And we know, though, that in recessions, we can still pay our bills, but but you've got to keep the pricing of your rents high enough to pay that. But what, what Eric's pointing at is once you've got the well developed, it's low cost. There's no plan to have debt in this fund. Zero. Right. That's zero. Price. So so not only does that delink us from interest rates, but the sensitivity to your pricing goes down dramatically because you're not carrying this large debt load with you. And that's gonna be challenging for the multifamily investors that are on the line to let that sink in. How could you operate with debt? Well, a company that wants to ride out a recession, even in the fluctuating price market, can do that if they structure it without debt. And that's precisely what we're planning to do. Yeah, Love it. excuse me, and another great point there is you'll find a lot of oil and gas funds that that tie their inventory or future inventory to futures so we own our inventory you know we we will sit on inventory if we see a price spike coming while we hedge so a, a lot of big words there as well sorry but uh, that just means that <laughs> simply simply what we do is by owning the inventory and not having exposure to interest rates this fund is complete equity there is no debt intended on this fund whatsoever. So if we need additional capital somewhere in the future because of rising inflationary trends or uh, supply chain issues, we'll raise more money. We won't go to a bank and, and pull debt. Uh, but I don't even foresee that happening right now because we're really built to scale at 200 million. So uh, Patrick brings up a great point. Just the lack of exposure to the interest rate fluctuations that we're seeing now and that I believe we will see by the end of the year again um, I think that we are in a great position to control our inventory, manage the pricing efficiently, and be able to return the best possible numbers we can to investors. Love it. I was going through questions. That's why you guys see me turning my head. I have another screen with all the questions to so making sure that we're hitting on them. And I think most of them did. So um, one thing that we didn't touch is, it seems like people are still asking, well, what if something comes up dry? Well, if you guys look at the line that says total locations, 200 plus, there's, they're not all going to be overflowing, but that's why there are so many that have been pre-qualified and identified so that, um, so that it can still be profitable, even if some are not actually profitable sites. So mm -hmm. that, um, you know, de-risking, like Patrick was explaining, um, instead of having one door, you have 200 doors so that if one is not producing, you have others. Another question is, um, has there been a, since there's no debt, has there been a capital call by King Operating um, for investors in the past? Um, Not once. 26 okay. years, no capital calls. Never done a capital call. But, right. but it was the case, though. And then what we want to point at is when COVID hit, it complete, the world stopped, right? Black Swan event. So obviously, investors lost everything. No, they didn't. Because in that time, Jay said, hey, look, we can ride this out, but I'll tell you what, let me just come out of pocket. Let me personally come out of pocket and buy a bunch of great deals, carry you guys forward and turning it into a win. And I'm in that fund and the investors didn't lose anything. And now they're, and so is Sarah, I think. Yes, you're in that fund too, the subs that, because we were grandfathered forward and won. So that is what you're looking for in an operator. Yeah, love it. And some people are still asking questions about what if the price is tank? In case you didn't hear, Eric was saying it's profitable even at 30 to 40 a barrel, right, Eric? Upper 30s, lower 40s, we're still profitable. Natural gas, profitable. we're profitable now, even at 225. We want we want real profits though. I mean, we're, those are thin margins, yeah. but those are thin margins, but it lets you know that for we're we're close to 80. So if we're okay at 40, but we're at 80, then that lets you know it's um 
not one of the biggest risks you should be concentrating on. Uh, comparing that to real estate, how many times have an operator said, hey, if the rents drop by half, we're going to be fine? Nobody yeah. says that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's having a heart attack. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the numbers. Um, people are starting to ask, hey, can you invest? What, what, what's the tax write-off? Can I invest with a self-directed IRA? Can I invest with an LLC? Can I invest personally? What's the whole thing? We're not LPs, we're GPs, all that kind of stuff. So sure. I'll start by saying, um, you know, when we invested in this, we invested in our name. So we have a holding company for our real estate. We have multiple holding companies for our real estate. We invested in our personal names with our social security numbers outside of an LLC. And so if this first pink box is attractive to you, reducing your tax burden, do not invest with your self-directed IRA, do not invest with you know, different entities, invest in your name. Um, and so I'm gonna show you guys how to do that in the portal when, we're, when we get through the slide deck. Um, but I really wanna point out that you are not in LP, technically you're a GP in this, in order to get that tax write-off, that's how you can reduce your W-2 income tax. Is you get your W-2, you get your paycheck in your name, right? Like when I had a, a job, I got a, my paycheck went to Sarah Sullivan and didn't go to my holding company. So if I wanna reduce the income tax to so what comes to Sarah Sullivan, um, this has to be in the name of Sarah Sullivan. So I really wanna clear that up. You can invest with other things, but you won't get the pink box. You won't get that reduced tax burden. So if that's important, invest as an individual. Well, and, and the key there is, is, is a simple term that any attorney understands, asset assignment. So we tell people all the time to invest personally into the fund. And as soon as you receive your document signed back from us, you do an asset assignment to your LLC. Um, the investment coming from you uh, should always come from, I invest through Eric Rice in the fund, period. Um, now I hold my assets in a trust and just like everyone else, but uh, you're, you're, you hit it dead on there. Your name is what's taxed, not your entity. Your, your personal you know, social security number is what you need to lower the income with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the minimum is 100K. I see that question a lot. Yep. The but it's in the document says 200K and that's going to be confusing. But part of what we negotiated to make this more accessible to multifamily investors is to give the same returns at a half unit at 100,000 versus two. And it should also be pointed out that for this month, for a limited amount of time, and should also be a motivator to those to take some time now to think about the investment, is that in the January, February tends to be the slowest part for investments across the board. And so we are incentivizing those that invest now, wake up from the holidays, spend some time before you get reminded again in March and April about how you should have invested to save your taxes. Let's do it now. Because what you invest now means we have stronger returns, stronger cash flow in quarter two, because we'll be able to put that work in that those funds to work in time to realize the, the cash flow in quarter two. So we do have an incentive currently, if you can make a move um, by the end of this month to invest, which can be very substantial uh, at the half and full unit mark. So how, can you explain it? What is the, what is the um, incentive? Yeah, so, so and I, yeah, once we get further, we'll talk about the way that the returns oh, okay. work, but in okay. general, yeah. it, imagine after your capital is returned, you have a split of the profits, right? And then we're, tip, we're, we're used to that in real estate, right? So after okay. your capital is returned, you have a split of the profit. And then above that, uh, we'll actually give you a 5% higher split of the profits if you invest at a half unit or a 10% uh, higher split of the profits if you invest at a full unit, which is 200K. Now, at a 3.4 equity multiple, that's actually very substantial. Yeah. It's a significant win for you designed to just, so you not to pressure you to make some a move before you're comfortable, but to incentivize you to take the time to decide whether or not this is an investment you want to do now versus wait until the 11th hour. Because what happens is just like in prior funds, those, re those incentives will go away. The returns will normalize. And then once we start distributing, the price of the unit is going to go up from 200 up to maybe 220, 225. And then you're going to be buying less. So if you're going to make the investment, do it now while you could potentially buy a car with the incentive on the other side, yeah. right? Well, it's it's awesome. fundamental with the market too. I mean, you're seeing the price of everything that produces income going up. And our investment's no different. So we'll give you a bigger back end incentive, and you'll also save on the discount. 
usually the second month when income starts in the fund, which is we're looking at April, May, uh, pr primarily April, we're already drilling and we don't have to frack in Texas. It's already loose gravel underneath the surface. So we're saving millions by not having to frack. Um, by the way, just I've seen a couple questions. You, you can drink frack water. <laughs> it's, there, there's a big, uh, big, big push out there to say fracking is bad. It's just water and sand and very light chemicals to break up rock. That's all it is. Um, actually fairly economical and environmental. But after the, the investment actually starts returning monthly income to you, our last fund, we were we, we did a 10% a 10 raise across the board to close out the fund. And just about everyone who's in before that has been extremely happy with the, the results of saving that 10% on the, on the actual investment amount. Love it. So what you guys are seeing, the 14 to 21% Cash flow, so it starts in, if you invest in February, it starts in April or it starts in May, Eric? Uh, so so it get, it determ it's determined by the dirt. So with us right now, we actually planned on uh, our, our investment starting to return monthly passive income or mailbox money to everybody um, by, by April or March. So March, we already knew we had a one month delay on getting a rig there. So we mm -hmm. moved it back a month for drilling. So that moved MPI back one month, but we're shooting for the end of April right now to start doing returns. And that'll be on one well. So it won't be the full 14 to 21%. It will right. build up and scale over time. Each well mm -hmm. adds to the monthly income for a period and then it'll start to decline. These are all declining assets over time. So that's why we continually drill wells. That's why we have a, a, 20, a 20 well mark for 2023 in this fund and 40 PUDs. So over the course of three to five years, we plan to drill 60, 70 wells in the fund in total. That'll keep the income uh, gradually increasing as opposed to declining with the asset. Let, let me just contain that real quick because you're talking to a bunch of real estate investors. And when they say gradually increasing, they're thinking like, okay, it goes up by 1% or 2% or 3%. That's not the case. This isn't your grandmother's annuity. It's not a stabilized multifamily property where we're renovating every month. This is a drill fund. And he said a couple of things in there where things can ebbs and flow. The, the range of 14 to 21% can be misleading to multifamily people. What this is, is annualized averages over the life of the investment. And if you took the, the, month, the annualized monthly payments over the life of the investment, you did the average of those, and it's likely to fall within that 14 to 21%. If you look back at the track record slide, you're going to see the past investments that they did. They ebbs and flowed. The, 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 they went up and down. And the reason why is because there is, as what Eric was saying, it's not just like you're building a building and slowly adding in renters. It's that when you first uh, open the tap, right, you're going to get what's called large production. And then, then it's going to stabilize. And, and you're going to open that up a mile deep and a couple miles across. And then sequentially, you're going to begin to see more and more and more production and then it's going to taper. Meanwhile, you're doing that in lots of other wells, but then we might take some and sell it, right? And then it's going to lower again. And you're going to see some, some rising and some lowering, and some rising and some lowering. Not necessarily pricing it because you're in a drill fund and things are actually rising and lowering, but you're building the reserves and you're building legacy cash flow over time that then we convert to a return of capital that then we convert to an exit multiple. So you just need to be prepared that you got to be ready for the ride on these kinds of investments. Um, all right, so I have some questions on the, the equity multiple. So I believe it does include that cash flow. So it's not like when you exit, if you put in 200K, when you exit, you don't get a check for 680. That 680 includes the cash flow that you've already received. Um, but there is a question, um, have you guys seen, so Terry, I haven't been working with them long enough to see this, but the question is people who exited um, fund one and fund two, did you see them reinvest in fund three <coughs> and fund four? Did they take mm -hmm. their three X equity multiple from fund one and put it back in? Yes, we have about a 30% recapture rate uh, right off the bat with investors. That number will go up because of the tax incentive. So as we see this, uh, the whole big story, the picture of King operating, this isn't our, our last fund. This is, this is really fund two in a series of eight. So we will have a consistent open fund available. So when you exit one fund and now have a taxable event, you'll be able to redeploy into a new, a new investment to reduce that tax burden. We also have a 1031 exchange fund we're gonna launch by the end of the year, which will 
help you even with an exit from a real estate um, venture into an oil and gas deal. So we have that that 1031 being work, worked on right now, but wow. there's always going to be an open available fund for you. Okay, cool. Because somebody was so asking, and I was gonna, then it'll be done. I was going to say you can't 1031 exchange, but it sounds like you're saying you certainly you can. can. Yeah, well, okay. not right now. I, and I would say if you're going to invest, now's an opportune time to do that with cash, right? And that that is a fund that will house divestitures from the last fund, this fund, and potentially exchange real property into it. But we're looking at for that, that second half of the year. Yeah, that's right? way that's out. Some, that's way out. So yeah. stay focused on that. So that's the program five. So, but stay focused on this one right now yeah. where prices are just, incredible. The political situation is amazing. I certainly wouldn't defer the decision until then. No, Got it. Don't do that. The, the, you don't want to miss out on the assets that we have right now either. You don't find, you know, 12,000 with an expansion rate to 25,000 acres of land with one owner and one middle right owner. That does not exist, especially with that type of uh, inventory below the surface. You, you really, that Borden County project is, is truly unicorn-esque. I won't say it's a unicorn, but it's unicorn-esque. So there, there's some uh, comments about the tax advantages. I think the next slide actually has that breakdown, which cool. I think I'll is. Jump... Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I'll jump to that in a sec. I do want to say, because some people were saying, how does this, the, they don't understand the middle box. So I want to say those calculations are on a 200K unit. So one unit is 200K. So if you invested $200,000, 14% is uh, $28,000 a year divided by 12 months is the $2,333 per month. So it's not that you'll get consistently that number every month, but it's saying on the, the low end of the expectation, if you invested one unit, which is 200,000, then on average, you'd get $233 per month. Okay. And, the, and, the, and the one guarantee is that your monthly income will fluctuate. Based on production, <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a yeah. it's apparent in the prior slides, right? That you're going to see that. Yeah. But the net yeah. returns are higher than than real estate. There's a little different mm -hmm. risk profile, and there's tax advantages, which actually make them even better. Mm -hmm. But it's an essential need, like real estate, that provides for a great return. Um, and some people are asking for details on what the payouts have been. So there is in this slide deck. We won't go over it today, but you can download it from the portal and see the details of the past. Okay, let's do the tax because I see a lot of questions. Here we go. Mm -hmm. And we can, I can also answer the GP one too, if, it, if you'd like. Oh and yeah, it plays, go for it. It plays into this tax slide. And yeah. so, so what, if you're a real estate investor on this call, then you're probably aware that when you invest in a multifamily syndication, uh, like, like one of Sarah's, you're gonna get this big paper loss on your K-1 in the first year. Uh, and that paper loss, they're going to be like, oh, that's great. But all of a sudden you realize you can't use it on your active day job. The one that you, the day job that you use to earn all the income to be able to invest into energy, uh, unless you qualify as something called the real estate professional, which is very hard to do if you're active at not being a real estate professional, which is most of us, right? So what's very unique about natural gas and oil drilling, working interest, they call it. You've heard that being thrown out. It just means you're actually investing in the process of harvesting hydrocarbons. And the IRS desperately needs people to do that to stimulate it here domestically. They have a mechanism that's in your CPA. If they're not specifically familiar with natural gas and oil, uh, then they may not know this, uh, which is why we have a sample K1 that you can download. We have a tax worksheet you can download. And we also have a third party tax opinion that they can actually go through and see the actual yeah. lines within the IRS code. And so all of those things lean towards, if you invest as an individual uh, yourself or through a trust, uh, that investment can come off your ordinary income, which is your W-2 income, your K-1 income, your bonuses, all of that stuff that typically in real estate doesn't allow you to take it. So this, example here is built around the assumption that you might be an income earner hypothetically making 400k a year just for the numbers here what if you invested 200,000 into this investment all right now in that come and in, in that case we would pass a 75% k1 
paper loss, essentially. It's not depreciation like in real estate, doesn't really matter. It's called intangible drilling costs, not really important, but the 75% at least in the first year and the 100% you saw in the prior slide would be in total over subsequent years, but that 75% in the first year would reduce. So you make $400,000, you invested 200, right, into this deal. 75% of that would reduce your taxable income. So instead of getting taxed on 400, you're likely to get taxed on something more like 225. No, I'm sorry, 250. 70, 100, 100, 75% of 200 is 150,000. So now, first of all, like we're not CPAs, financial planners, and attorneys, and you talk to your own team. But since you're not getting taxed on 400, you're getting taxed on 250. So you just reduced your taxable income that reduced your tax bracket. If you're, if you're at a 40% marginal tax rate, which a lot of our investors are, people that are out making a lot of money, slaving away at their job, 40% of 150,000, that's 60 grand, 60,000. So it's 60,000 on a 200,000 investment for most of our investors where that where those numbers make sense. Uh, it's, it's 30 grand on 100,000. And that's what Robert Kiyosaki in the earlier video was saying, you invest 100 grand, the government is saying, look, I'm not gonna tax you on that, right? I, I'm gonna let you keep it. In fact, you can borrow that essentially, you can keep, hang on to it, and I'm gonna let you put it to work in an investment where you make a return. And so now you've kind of, you're all in at 70, right? Because at taxes, you got maybe 30 grand back, right? Well, how does that work in multifamily? Well, you gotta make 100,000, right? And then if you invest at 100,000, well, you still have to pay taxes on that 100,000, right? So, so if it, that 100,000 that you invested with was ordinary income, you're still paying taxes on it. So if you invest 100,000, now you're kind of all in at 130 after taxes. Well, in this investment, you invest 100,000, you're kind of all in at 70, but you're collecting cash flow on 100,000 invested. You're collecting an equity multiple on 100,000 invested. And sure, if, if, if when we sell, like in real estate, there's a recapture event, the government might say, hey, look, you got all this profit on money that I let you keep, but I may need to recapture some of that that I let you keep, unless you participate in, which is a completely unique thing about this versus every other oil and gas that I've seen, a 1031 exchange vehicle, which Eric was alluding to, which would allow you to trade that forward into subsequent investments. So the tax advantage and legacy wealth building that the IRS provides is dramatically better essentially than real estate. Now they're both there. They both have their place in a non-correlated diversified portfolio, but you can get further by spending the government's money a little bit more efficiently in the natural gas and oil. Awesome, I appreciate that. And I wanna, um, I think I see a lot of tax questions and here's what I wanna say. If you guys um, click in the link, there's a link to the investor data room, and I'm going to show you what it looks like so that um, you can take these, these uh, documents that Patrick was referring to, to your CPA and ask them, because some of you are real estate professionals, so some of you are saying, hey, can I, um, can I still take advantage of this? If I'm a real estate professional, I don't have a W-2 income. So here's the, the link that I just gave you will bring you to this screen. Um, and then once you're here, you can see this second line that's a highlight. It says, place your investment reserve here. Um, so when you do that, you'll have access to download, see this document section. We have a sample K1. Um, we have tax benefit worksheet for your CPA. So once you register, then you'll be able to download all of these documents. There's the full business plan that we went through today um, and the full PPM and, and everything that you need is in the document section. So from this page, if you place your investment reserve here, click on this, it's going to um, take you to a registration page. I'll show you what it is. I'll click on it and show you. You put in your reserve here. And then once you put in your reserves, your name and your email address, then you get your own personal, you'll get this. So now this is your own personal data room. It says for Sugo Capital Investors, because that's the test name I'm using. But you know, if Sarah Sullivan invested, it would say data room for Sarah Sullivan. And now in the documents section, I can download any of those that I want. 
Um, and then in order to continue your subscription, you would click subscribe here in the top right corner, the green button. And of course it's asking me to re-log in, but that's how you would begin the process. And when you, when you talk to your CPA, um, so I, like I said, I took this sample K1, I took it to my CPA and I said, I want to, I want to invest in a safe way, you know, asset protection, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to invest in my name. I want to invest in my LLC. And he told me, you have to invest in your name. Well, it was my husband's name. He is the W2 in order to get the tax advantage for his income. So take this sample K1 to your CPA. And then when you're subscribing, it's going to say, how are you subscribing? So if your CPA says you have to subscribe as an individual, then go ahead and subscribe as an individual. Um, people are asking, hey, can I invest with my solo 401k or my IRA? You can, but know that you won't get that tax advantage. So then you will get the, the cash flow and the equity multiple, but you won't get the tax advantage. So really, I'm, I, I know I'm repeating myself. Um, but it's, because it's so important, and, and Patrick had this experience as well, that people would subscribe in the name of their LLC, and then they wanted to take the advantage of the person. Same with real estate. We've had people invest in real estate thinking that they can you know, take the tax advantage um, against their W-2 income and all this stuff. So really, I want to say, take this, um, the tax documents to your CPA, have them advise you on how you can, what's the best way to su subscribe in order to take advantage they'll be able to tell from these documents. All right, um, I'm not sure where to go from here. People still have a ton of questions. So you guys are really, <laughs> you guys are really excited. Um, go ahead and place your reserve. So in the chat, um, I put a link, go ahead and put in your reserve. And then that's when you get access to the next steps in order to subscribe and all of that. Um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and Let's talk about one that I saw a lot um, around the risk of being a GP. Like, what is your liability? Um, so yeah, I, I compared to, can I, or go, go ahead, Eric. So I'll, I'll let Patrick translate to multifamily. Uh, <laughs> right. Single-minded, single-minded people over here. Yeah, let me compare it to real estate investing, okay? Because, you know, you, you, may, you may actually own a rental property yourself and if you go or even a, you probably own your own home and essentially in that in that deal where you own your own home you've signed on the property yourself in your own name and you're probably on debt too in your own name so you're kind of your own sponsor and if somebody comes in trips and falls you're kind of unlimited liability to that right they can sue you to no end and and so in, in every single one of your multifamily rentals, that's the case too, right? There's a big there's a there's a challenge. So people buy umbrella policies, right? They buy insurance policies to protect against that. Now in Sarah's multifamily deals over here, you have the ability to become a limited partner, where you don't sign on debt, and you're subscribing to a subscription into something where if there's a lawsuit, trip and fall, or that you're in an LLC. Right, so you're protected, and if even if the building, those loans are non-recourse, but even if the building is uh, collapses, you you only risk your initial investment, all right, because you're risking your capital while it's in the deal, all right. So now, what is the difference in that LLC situation, that limited partnership situation in Sydney? You can only use because you're entirely passive. You can only use the tax advantages to write off other passive income, not active income. So what's it, where does this oil and gas fall? Somewhere in between, okay? Fall somewhere in between because when you're investing into something, but for a limited amount of time, you're not going to invest as an LP if you want the tax advantages. And I, have, I have a diversified fund and a family office and a foreign entity that they don't get the tax advantages anyway, so they invest as an LP. You can do that, right? You just get the, the non-correlated asset, monthly passive income and an equity multiple. That's just fine. But if you want to be an active, you want to get the active write-offs to offset your high-income job, then you want to be you want to invest as a general partner in your own name. Now, when you do that as a single-family rental owner, you get insurance. All right. Now, uh, but you're also signing on debt. In this case, you don't have to sign on any debt. In fact, there's no plans to have debt right in this fund, so you're actually more protected 
than I was when I lost everything in 2009 and 10 because I signed a bunch of personally guaranteed notes for pre-development and it drove me through the coals. You're actually more protected because you're not signing on debt. And this company has $25, $26 million insurance policy, which is many X what's required by the government for natural gas and oil drilling operators, right? So for the limited amount of time that you are a GP, you're covered by insurance just like you would be on a single family, but you're also limited uh, on a financial situation uh, from, from debt. You're shielded because that's not there like you would on a single family. Now, we keep you there at that GP because if you choose to want the tax advantages, you invest that way. Now, what Eric is saying is that, by the way, we flip you. The class of share, the A-class shares, goes from general partner to limited partner when we do that return of capital event. Right, so we want to keep you as a GP until it, it until it's safe, so you can maximize your tax advantages, which is the intangible drilling cost, right? Which we talked about, a little different than depreciation. Um, so we'll keep you there until we do the return of capital, and then we flip everybody to a limited partner. So again, it's part of that short period of time, that duration, um, and in that time, you'll collect intangible drilling costs uh, uh, in the first year. You'll also continue to collect intangible drilling costs to offset your, mat, your pass, monthly passive income. You'll collect depreciation, which we're familiar with, on tangible assets. So there's the intangible, and then there's the tangible assets, which are the things we're actually building, developing in this fund, and depreciation. And you'll collect depletion. Depletion is, the IRS is saying, you know what? You've got to reserve your, your selling natural gas and oil. It's depleting reserve. So we're going to give you an allowance for that because you're producing something we need we're not gonna charge you a lot of taxes on that. So you're gonna get all these things that stack up that offset your monthly passive income until we do that return of capital event. Now at that point, you're profitable. So there's the intangible drilling, we flip you to LP, intangible goes away, the active part goes away, you're a limited partner, and then your depreciation continues and depletion continues. So you're at a limited tax position, but you're also a limited partner, right? Until we do the full divestiture. Now, on the divestitures, you can trade forward. What Eric is saying is that if you don't like being in a GP, the most conservative approach is what I just said. You stay a GP until we flip you to LP and you move forward. But Eric is saying, which, which is that you could also invest as a GP and like what single family operators do. Single family operators will buy a property in their own name. They'll get debt in their own name. And then as soon as they do that, I'll hot swap it over to an LLC. <laughs> and so what, 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 what Eric is saying is precisely what single family operators do when they want to buy something in their own name because they want to get the tax advantage, they want to get the debt advantage of getting better debt that way, but then they don't want to get sued, so they'll put it under an LLC. Uh, that is something up to your own discretion, your own decision. And we're certainly not recommending that you make a move like that, but that is what a lot of investors do within these funds. Yeah, and the write-off and the, the GP and the write-off work hand in hand. So as a GP, you get the write-off. The write-off is, I'll keep it simple. The write-off is, is created on the way we spend money. There's a protocol for, for the tax code where we'll spend money to buy things in advance. So money that comes in the door today, it's actually buying supplies we need for six, eight months down the road. It helps us fight off inflation, supply chain issues, all those things. But the GP itself, the way we drill a, a well there's usually about 94 to 97 contractors that all have their own liability insurance. So each part of the drill process and, and the extraction process, they all have independent coverage on top of our umbrella. And we carry $20 million in insurance on our own for each, each project. So we're very well covered. I keep getting the question, I keep seeing it popping up about uh, pollution and spills. Uh, in our industry, that's, that's more for the tankers and the shipping companies. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. offshore guys, we don't spill. We don't we don't have access to the ocean to begin with. And groundwater hasn't been a contamination issue in our industry in, in the better part of 25 years. So green standards have been implemented into oil and gas to offset the possibility of tainting groundwater. Mm -hmm. Or a mile, mile below the water table is where we're drilling. Yeah, at least a mile. Hi, Ben Cat. I see your question. If you have an LLC and invest through the LLC, can I still qualify as a GP? Yes, but I don't believe it'll allow you to reduce your W-2 income tax. There wouldn't be any point, right? There's the other. It's just, just like, invest as an LP. Yeah. 
Yeah. Or, or be a GP in your own name. That's, that's, mm -hmm. I would say 95% of our investors are GP in their own name and you become an LP, not at divestiture or capital return. You you become an LP as the last dollar is allocated. So as if we raise 200 million, when the $200 million is deployed into the oil field, all, all GPs get converted to LPs with the exception of King. So that, that generally will happen about 18 mm. months. Mm. So right. the, awesome. there's a question about who insures. We do have the insurance certificate. That is something that we can send. Yeah. Uh, so if that's something that you would inquire about, we can make sure that gets to you. Yeah, why don't you send that to me and I'll put it in the data room. Mm -hmm. And I still see people saying they're having trouble, they can't see. So I'm gonna share my screen one more time. So I'm gonna put the link here, use this link. Use this link. And so it's gonna bring you to this page. Some people are asking, what is a reserve? Reserve is basically saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'd like to invest $200,000 in this. So you simply put in your name. How much are you looking to invest? Are you a credit investor? Yes. I'm not a robot. Submit. Okay. And then when you go back, then what you're going to see is this. It's going to be in your name. It'll save a data room for Sarah Sullivan. Then you'll be able to go to documents and access these documents. You'll be able to download it one at a time or click download all. And then up here in the upper right-hand corner where it's green, you click subscribe. And so that's how you begin the paperwork. Now I'm not, I'm not logged in as an LP, I'm logged in as an admin, so that's why it's funky. But I hope that helps you guys get access to what you need. So go ahead and use that link, put in a reserve, and then you'll, you'll get access to everything. I think just made it yeah, so we just didn't want it to be like out there in the ether that anyone could download this information, which is why we're doing it that way. You know, I could have said that, you know, from this link, anyone can download the information, um, which Eric, I don't know what King's policy is on that, but we usually don't do that. We usually say, hey, you know, if you want to review the, the tax information and all this, the PPM, at least, you know, register, let's have your name, your email, so that we know who's looking at this stuff. You know, it's not just being thrown out in the ether for anyone to kind of mess around with, because there's also that increases fraud, it increases accessibility to all the information, you know, why your information Absolutely. is in there. Um, so it's for your own security and the security of the investment and the other investors in there that we say, hey, click this link, register first, and then you can download it. Um, you'll be able to, I'll send out the email where you can watch this recording again, and there's not going to be any registration required to watch this, but if you want to download the PPM and all that stuff, you will need to register. Um, and a uh, question, and I think I'll take one more question and then we'll release the wonderful hosts that are with me today. Um, credit investor, do we need to provide a certificate? Because when you go through the subscription paperwork, it does ask you to self-certify. Then do we need a third party? to say yes, you know, like a CPA or an attorney or something like that to sign off and say you are accredited. You see heads shaking, yes. Yes, yes, it's accredited <laughs> investors only. Yeah, even though it, even though the questionnaire is there, um, not to say anyone on this call isn't, but people aren't always honest about those things. So we do require a third party verification yeah. of accreditation. It's an audit yeah. checklist, but the self-accreditation allows you then us to do a look back. Because if once you invest one time, you don't have to do that again for five years now, that's a new law. And, and the PPM, as long as you continue to self-certify through that PPM in future investments, then we don't need it again. So that's great. Correct. And I see um, questions about, hey, you know, like what if my spouse is not accredited? Well, your spouse can be accredited because the, um, you know, like if your spouse makes 50K and you make 300K, if your joint household income is over 300K, or your joint net worth. So if you have a net worth of a million dollars, your spouse qualifies as an accredited investor as well, even if they make 50K or 75K, because you can qualify by net worth. So you don't need to qualify by all three ways. Um, it's just one of the ways. If you, if you uh, qualify, then, then you're good to go. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, okay. 
think everyone should have access now because in the background, I was just double checking everything's working on the back end. Um, everyone should have access. We have a boatload of people who just signed up. So it's really exciting, you guys. Um, if you're on this webinar, know that you're in good company. There were hundreds of people on and they even stayed for almost two hours. <laughs> so I think this is a fantastic investment. Um, like I said, my husband and I, we invested his entire W-2 income into this um, in order to get the tax write-offs. So we think it's really awesome. We're all in. Um, and it was quite an honor to meet the extended team, Eric on the executive team over at King Operating and Patrick, you've been wonderful to partner with on getting this information ready for our investor community. Sugo Capital investors, um, thank you for being part of this community. Thank you for staying on for almost two hours during what is probably a vacation day for you. Um, we're sending out the replay. You can share it with anyone you want and they can listen to it on 1.5 X. So it only takes them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> less time than two hours to watch all of it. Um, request access to the portal and then you can review the, the documents, the subscription documents. You get all, all the information you need in order to subscribe. And then if you have any questions after that, um, you know, there's a lot of people. So Eric and Patrick, depending on how things go over the next week, I may see, maybe we just have a Q&A session a week from now because I see a lot of people and probably what they're gonna do is take this to their spouse, take this to their business partner, take this to their financial advisor, take this to their CPA, and then they're gonna have some questions they didn't think of today. And so, you know, since there were 750 people signed up for this, that's a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations to catch. So um, if we didn't answer your question today, be on the lookout in your email, because I might organize with these guys to have another Q&A session in a week or two from now, once you've had time to, you know, digest. And then we can do a one-to-many Q&A session again, which won't be a presentation, but just Q&A if Eric and Patrick, if you guys are open to that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, there's a couple things we can do. So we can bring Rex on because there's gonna be a lot of tax questions, and he's he's yeah. the guru. So I turn okay. it over. Awesome. On the other hand, um, you know, there one thing we see a lot with syndication groups: if you reach out to us directly or reach out through Sarah, you're getting the same deal. Uh, there oh, yeah. is no, there is no compensation that comes out of pocket for mm -hmm. Sarah for you. So reach out to Sarah directly. Uh, we have an overflow team available. So we have George running point for everything. And we have 11 other SVPs that are willing to take your call. So Sarah, if you get overwhelmed, uh, feel free to just send them our way and we can do one-on-one. -on -one. Our, our full our full deck presentation is a little bit longer, more detail on methodology, uh, things like that. So if you want one-on-one -on -one attention and you want to have a presentation, absolutely feel free to reach out. We're here to serve any way we can. And the guys in the guys at King Operating have decades and decades of years of experience. They can go as deep as you'd like, which is George is on this still, and he's incredible like that. Rex, Rex as Eric was saying, I can't say enough good things. So there should be there shouldn't be any questions that, that could not be very thoroughly answered. And you are investing directly with the operator on this. So yeah. really glad to have uh, Sarah on the team. So there is there is no difference there. Yeah, that's, like I'm, I'm glad you asked that because people ask me that all the time. I'm like, no, it's not like I take a point or two and then you get a right. lower rate. It, there's nothing like that. It's the same whether you go through any of us. Um, You're all advisors. Your... So we, we take care of our advisors. You don't have to. Yeah, exactly. All right. So I'm going to drop the link one more time. Go in the chat. Click that link if you haven't already. Put in your name, your email address, and that will give you access. I still some people saying I can't get access, click that, put in your name and email address, you will get access. All right, thank you again, Patrick and Eric and investors. This was awesome. What enthusiasm, I appreciate that enthusiasm for everyone who's been on here. Thank you very much. And um, Dan, you're asking me, just click the link. It's too, <laughs> how do we get in? There's a link in the chat, guys. Click the link in the chat. <laughs> That's how you get in. All right. You're welcome, everyone. Signing off. Have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.